Today is a very special day for my dungeon masters out there because I am about to give you a great tool to use in your adventures. If you're only acquainted with 5th edition, then you probably don't know much about the Inevitables. These guys are, for the lack of a better word, the cops of the Outer Plains. The guys will put in the handcuffs in your hands if you go hog wild, doing things that you probably should not be doing. I know that many of you have probably thought to yourself, well, who is out there to stop any particular extremely powerful mage from just unraveling the nature of of the world, and well, well, here they are. There is not a single mention of them in the Monster Manual. Instead, at least for 5th edition, you have to go all the way to Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes to get even just a tiny bit of info on them. Here we have the Marut, a challenge rating 25 construct. That challenge rating makes him stronger than anything but the Tarask in the Monster Manual, and makes him even stronger than every single Devil Lord except for Asmodeus and Sariel, and stronger than every single Demon Lord except for Orcus and Demogorgon. This guy slaps, and it has has to. If it's going to be an effective cop, it has to be extremely powerful. Now this guy is just one type of inevitable, but let's go ahead and read his entry so that then we can talk about the stuff that they didn't tell you. It says here that the nigh unstoppable inevitables serve a singular purpose. They enforce contracts forged in the Hall of Concordance in the city of Sigil. Primus, the leader of the Modrons, created Maruts and other inevitables to bring order to dealings with planner folk. Many creatures, including Yugalots, will enter into a contract with inevitables if asked. The Hall of Concordance is an embassy of pure law in Sigil, the city of Doors. In the Hall, two parties who agree to mutual terms and who pay the requisite gold to the Collierate, a mechanical engine of absolute jurisprudence, can have their contract chiseled onto a sheet of gold that is placed into the chest of a Marut. From that moment until the contract is fulfilled, the Marut is bound to enforce its terms and to punish any party who breaks them. A Marut resorts to lethal force only when a contract calls for it, when the contract is fully broken or when the Marut is attacked. Then lastly, it says that the Inevitables care nothing for the spirit of an agreement, only the letter. A Marut enforces what is written, not what is meant by or supposed to be understood from the writing. The Collierate rejects contracts that contain vague, contradictory or unenforceable terms. Beyond that, it doesn't care whether both parties understand what they are agreeing to. A small army of solicitors awaits outside of the Hall of Concordance, eager to sell their expertise in the crafting or vetting of contracts. Now, of course, there is a lot here that they're not telling you about these creatures, but we will get to that in just a minute. In here, we can see the stat sheet, and it is honestly quite impressive. Notice that in spite of the fact that it is a construct, it possesses genius-level intelligence, but it's not just a computer in terms of intellect, it is also very very wise. You will see here that his attacks literally cannot miss, they just automatically hit, and they also possess the ability to instantly teleport their prey right into the Hall of Concordance, presumably right into a prison or right in front of a judge. Now this will be a kick-ass episode, so let's go ahead and talk about what they didn't tell you about the Inevitables, right after of course our sponsor today. So Reroll is an app, which you can get through either the Google Store or the App Store on any phone, or on PC of course, you can access it through any browser. Through this app, you can create your D&D character in pixel art. Basically, it functions as a character sheet. You can add in all of your character's stats, abilities, background stuff, items, I mean everything. Reroll, however, also allows you to create the look for your character, which is what sets it apart from any of the other character sheet apps. They have all the races, and each of them have different features that you can change, like hairstyles and beards and facial features. They allow you to change the colors for literally everything as well, but the cool twist that this app does that the other apps don't is that you can equip your character that you have created with tons of different items, so you can customize your D&D character as exactly how you envision him in your head. And this here is Gogron, my half-orc barbarian from Ghosts of Saltmarsh. I have very specifically picked every single piece in here for my character as I envisioned him, and of course I could have changed the color for any of these items. And you could also add notes to each of these pieces, so for example, if I got this axe from my quest, I could add notes about special properties that he might have, or I could even add in its damage. Now, after you create your character, you can very easily download it through the app, and then if you want, you can add the picture to your profile or whatever service that you use to play Dungeons and Dragons. So here you can see my splash screen for Ghost of Saltmarsh with the two characters that I have created. They look so cool. The base here that the characters are standing on is also exchangeable, so you get a bunch of options for what you want to have in there instead. You can get the app for free and get access to a bunch of options, or you can pay around, I believe it's $10 right now, and get over 300 armor pieces 
over 150 weapon options. They got pets that you can put in there for the art. You can see the uh, pet here on the Dragonborn. They got a bunch of stuff, man. I believe they currently have 30% off right now, so it's just $7. So go ahead and check them out, guys. That's, that's Reroll on the phone stores or on app.reroll.co. Links are all in the description. Anyways, let's continue with the inevitables. The Inevitables are shrouded in mystery. There really isn't much about their past or how they first came to be. The stories first speak of powerful, angelic-like creatures who colonized world after world in the name of law. They were called the Afanax. These guys lived in Mechanus, the outer plane of neutral law, and from there they enacted crusade after crusade, conquering worlds and forcing them into their strict, rigid code of laws. They were eventually stopped and destroyed by a coalition of gods, and the alliance between the Archons and Eladrins of the Upper Plains and the Fiends of the Lower Plains. However, what happened next is kind of unknown. All we're told is that after the war was over, titanic fortress-like forges were created in Mechanus. These forges could not be penetrated by anyone and all divination spells designed to ascertain their purpose would fail and from those forges, decades later, came the Inevitables, seemingly being now constructed inside. Now, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes claims that it was Primus, the greater god that controls most of Mechanus, who created them, but in the player's guide to Faerun, it claims that it was Mistra who created them. Perhaps it might have been a, a union of power between the two who made this happen, but for the last 10,000 years, essentially, these forges have been creating these constructions of order. Now, there are many kinds of inevitables, and each of them is designed very specifically for a purpose, a purpose that is branded onto them magically from birth, and a purpose that they will above all else complete. Now these purposes are important. These constructs are not really designed to just be petty cops, but instead to hunt down those who violate fundamental principles of nature. If someone were to stop entropy, if someone were to cast too many wishes to alter time, if a fey lord were to make an oath and not keep it, if a great criminal would escape judgment from a court of gods, or if someone would attempt to kill a god, or if someone attempts to become a god. These are the violations that you might see an inevitable get involved with. Now, Mechanus is a realm of law and order, and every gear has its place. Every cog has a function in the machine, and every kind of inevitable is created for a purpose. My roots have a purpose, and that purpose is not to simply be the executioner in case that someone reneges their contract. What you are described here in More Than Kingdom's Storm of Foes is merely an example of an exception. My roots who have been taken out of their protocol in order to help Collierids perform their duty. Collierids deal with contracts, Maruts do not. A Marut is an inevitable created in order to hunt down those who violate the fundamental principles of entropy. Everyone dies eventually. For all intents and purposes, a Marut is a hunter of liches. Beings who go through complex rituals in order to become undead and live forever. Though anyone who has unnaturally extended their lifespan to an unreasonable degree could be targeted by a Marut. This would also include necromancers who have raised too many undead, or even clerics or alchemists who have resurrected others repeatedly or who have resurrected others to a massive scale. Anyone who extends their own life or their life of others to an unnatural degree is a target for a Marat. Now, when an inevitable finds its target, it will judge it depending on its transgression. Most times, this does not mean death, and sometimes there can even be wiggle room for appeasement of the offended victim if there is a victim, though in the case of the Marat, none of that really applies. The offense in this case is living when you should not, and hence, the only judgment that a Marat can apply to the offender is to make it not live by, of course, killing it. Marats basically always judge death when they find their target. Now, after their mission is complete, inevitables enter what they call observation mode. It will wander the landscape and passively observe life around it. Quote, when it discerns another transgression of the principle that it is dedicated to, it has a new mission. Inevitables tend to stick out in a crowd while they are in observation mode, but they seem oblivious to the attention. Those in the know who hear about a 12-foot-tall, golden-armored statue roaming the countryside might seek out the inevitable and present a case hoping that it will take on the alleged transgressor. The decision is based on the idiosyncrasies of the inevitable's programming, so there is no guarantee." End quote. 
See, inevitables can actually form what one would call a personality. This is of course possible since they are extremely intelligent and wise and hence fully sentient machines. These personalities develop as the inevitable wanders the land and learns of its environment. Things that are needed for the inevitable to actually will find its prey. However, the word personality might be overdoing it a bit. It's really more like quirks that they develop. The constructs are single-minded and only focused on their mission. Nothing else matters. They don't form bonds with people or emotional connections. They do often form alliances with other beings, though, if it'll help them accomplish their goal, but they will have no qualms on sacrificing an ally if it will help reach its goal. Remember that they are neither good nor evil. They are just pure lawful. If you already are willing to risk your life to go into a dungeon to help an inevitable, then the inevitable will assume that you're totally okay with sacrificing your life for the cause. Outside of their willingness to sacrifice allies, they are on their orders to leave innocents alone, so they will not mess with communities unless they are harboring the criminal or withholding information on purpose. A new inevitable who has just been constructed will likely threaten and possibly torture one who is purposefully withholding information on the target, whereas an experienced inevitable will use what it has learned in the past to get its information better. What is interesting though is that these experiences that the inevitable learns as it goes on missions really, really does change the constructs dramatically by giving it extreme quirks. If 4 out of 5 Dragonborn lied to the inevitable when it first made it into a new world, then you might consider that Dragonborn have an 80% chance of lying whenever they are asked anything. So the construct might literally just never trust a Dragonborn ever for the rest of his existence. If the inevitable was attacked by human bandits as soon as it came into its first First world, it might assume that all humans are just hostile, or that all humans wearing bandanas and axes are hostile for the rest of its life. Inevitables are very, very quirky like that. Thing is, every mission that an inevitable completes, the stronger its desire will be to return home to Mechanus. Once home, the inevitable will have its memory wiped completely and given a new quest, whereupon it will set out again brand new. Nobody actually knows if these memories are completely wiped and deleted, or if they are transferred to some form of database or to some other creature. Much of what happens in these forges is really just a mystery to everyone. Now, generally speaking though, Marut specifically do not develop many quirks because they don't interact much with people. That is because their targets are typically isolated creatures that exist within the fringes of society. You know, there is no reason for the Marut to hang out in a city when the lich that he is hunting is probably hiding in the swamp of death. Though even just finding that information out can be rough for them. A Marat, for example, has the ability to plane shift, which allows it to go directly into the world where its target is located. Other inevitables are forced to literally walk to their destinations by taking portals or traveling through the astral plane. Thing is, plane shift is not a precise magic anyways, and Marats will often be dropped in a random place in the middle of a planet, and there they will be forced to ask questions, obtain directions, and go to where they think their target is. This means that sometimes they have to walk for months or years to get to the right area. Sometimes they literally have to walk through an ocean by simply just walking through the bottom of the sea to get to the other side. It is a very lengthy process and Marats in particular are built to withstand that. Because the target of a Marat is by definition one that cannot die or is unwilling to die, a Marat has to be disciplined and patient because their target literally has all the time in the world. If the Marat discovers that there is a prophecy that says that every Every 500 years, uh, an undead lich will come out of this here crypt, then the Marat will literally just sit there and wait 500 years if that is what it takes. Now, like I said, the Marats are just one kind of inevitable, the, the ones that deal with transgressors who violate the laws of death. In the book, they mentioned the Koliarats, so let's talk about them. The Koliarats are inevitables who oversee transgressors who violate oaths, promises, and contracts. Now, at first, you might not consider this a law of nature, but you have to remember that words have great power in this universe. Cursing someone by just verbally cursing them can actually 
Curse them for reals. Proclaiming an oath to justice can literally give you paladin levels. Making a powerful deal with a powerful entity can literally switch the way magic works around the two dealers. If a million farmers bow down and crown someone their king, that king has literal power over them. Emotions, words, packs, these things are forces of nature, and Kulirids have the task to judge violators of these laws. Kulirids have the power of magically understanding the nature of any contract. They can do this by simply being close to one of the affected parties, at which point, in a flash of inspiration, they obtain the contract in their heads. They will study the contract or oath to the fullest extent, to the point of perfectly understanding every every word, and then they will mete out justice. As Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes suggested, they're not interested in what one could understand from the contract. They simply care about what is written, as it is written, so to speak. And not all oaths, for example, are written, obviously, but they all get the same perfect understanding of the oath as it was said. Quote, a Kolirod won't be swayed by an Oathbreaker's claim of extenuating circumstances. The Kolirod, if given to conversation, would reply, The circumstances are indeed extenuating, but they aren't part of the contract. You are thus in breach. Avoiding confrontation with a Kolirod is as simple as returning to compliance, or, if it's a two-party contract, providing convincing evidence that the other party has also broken as part of the deal. Kolirats simply walk away from situations where both sides have broken a bargain." End quote. If the offender refuses to comply, then the Kolirats concept of what is appropriate justice will be whatever is stipulated in the contract. Then they will use magic like guias or suggestion in order to force the offender to comply. Rarely will you actually see a Kolirat actually kill a person, unless in either self-defense or if death was actually part of the contract. This is why you should never say, I promise on my life that I will do X. Now that's a, that's a very powerful promise that can draw the ire of a Kolirod, and if you are found, you will be executed since you promised on your life. In any case, the Kolirods are the most talkative and social out of all of the inevitables, since generally speaking, they can reach the best conclusions to their quest by talking to people. Now, another type of inevitable are the Quarats, which are some of the most interesting. Interesting because they arguably deal with the most uh, dangerous and dramatic of all of the different types of transgressors. Quarats' targets are those who violate the natural laws of time and space. In essence, individuals who can stop the flow of time itself or wish a new reality into existence. This is effectively what stops an art mage from just casting Wish every day in order to change everything that just doesn't satisfy him, or abusing time-related spells to the point of damaging the fabric of the world. Dealing with a quiet is also extremely difficult for the art mage, because rectifying the problem is generally speaking not as easy as simply fixing the new reality. Instead, you would have to rework time itself so that the change in reality was never made in the first place. Only this would ever satisfy the judgment of a quarret. Then we have the Varakhats, who are probably the most rare out of all of the types of inevitables. These deal with transgressors who violate the laws of, well, technically everything. Varakhats hunt those who seek godhood. Anyone who performs a credible bid to godhood becomes a target of a Varakhat. The key here, though, is the word credible. Quote, to attract the interest of a Varakhat, the attempt at godhood must be legitimate. Not every two-bit cult leader and would-be demigod is subject to the justice of a Varakhat. Only those on the cusp of becoming true deities. In some cases, powerful outsiders or would-be godlings intentionally antagonize Varakhats in an attempt to legitimize their bids to godhood. Once a Barakhod identifies a credible attempt at godhood, it studies its enemies like a Quarret does, learning as much as it can about its target before making a direct confrontation. The Varakhod prefers to thwart would-be deities by eliminating them directly, but it isn't above destroying artifact-level power sources or wreaking havoc on minions and worshippers if doing so weakens the prospective godling." End quote. Since the only judgement against one who would attempt to become a god is death, dealing with a Varakhod is basically close to impossible. Once one has its target on you, you can really only fight back or die. The only way in existence to ever stop a Varakhod's assault 
would be to actually fully become a god, since then, as a deity, you would be considered now part of the natural order which the inevitable is sworn to protect. Interestingly, there is an even rarer purpose that Varakuts can take. Since Varakhuts deal with gods and would-be gods, one can sometimes actually see a Varakhud take on the purpose of protecting a god from side the act of killing a deity. For example, a Varakhad that was previously helping a group of adventurers prevent a cult leader from becoming a god might actually turn on those same heroes the second the deification process finishes. The last type of inevitable that has been described in the lore is the Selekhut. And these guys deal with transgressors who have violated well, laws in general. Though more specifically, they deal with the tracking and haunting of those who have been judged and have escaped judgment. If a court of gods, for example, deems someone guilty in a proper trial, and that person somehow escapes judgment, that's when a Selekhud gets involved. So they're a little bit different from the rest in the sense that they're not really meant to be judge, jury, and executioners. Any of the other inevitables will deal with their targets in whatever way that they would find appropriate as long as justice and law would be upheld according to their own mannerisms and personalities. Selekhuts, on the other hand, are not meant to be judges or juries. They could be executioners if asked to be, but most often than not, they are merely supposed to track a fugitive and then bring it back to authorities alive. In this case, the, the law of nature that a Selekhut is meant to protect and watch over would be law itself. Law and chaos are real, natural, like existing powers, in the same way as oaths and promises could hold power. Just as an agent of chaos would bring chaos wherever it goes, so would a Selekhod bring law, by making sure that law and justice is met out in all worlds that it comes across. Alright guys, there it is. Thank you so much for watching. I love me some inevitables. I, I wish that we could see them in an adventure. In fact, taking, this, taking it a step further, I would actually wish that we could see a, a Modron adventure. That would be really dope. In any case, guys, uh, thank you for watching all the way over here. Uh, the only announcement that I have is that, um, once again, I've been saying this for a little bit, but I'm gonna try and focus uh, a lot on streaming this year. Uh, that's my my New Year's resolution. I do want to stream a lot more. So if you guys are interested in that, I'll have my Twitch channel on the description. Make sure that you go over and, and just follow me over there so that whenever I, I do happen to go over, I uh, you guys can see me. I will do some streaming on YouTube, but I'll probably only do that for D&D related stuff. So if like I'm maybe reviewing a new book or if I um, maybe even playing just like Baldur's Gate 3, then I, I would stream here. But for most other games, for most other things, I would probably just go on Twitch. So uh, make sure you click there and follow me over there. I, I would really appreciate it. Uh, and also, of course, make sure to check out our sponsor today. That's it's what keeps the lights up, keeps our food in our bellies. I would appreciate, of course, always if you guys help us out with all the sponsors. That's always great for us. That being said, I would like to now personally thank our patron supporters who also keep food in our belly. Barry Maskant, 5E Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Brad Salazar, Walker Motley, Terry Culp, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Ozol, Stefan, Alex Cookson, Falky951, Benjamin Bosters, Thomas Hunt, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, Sabim Kurshab, Solarensis, Ordoric, Nathan McComb, Silent Shoppa, Bushido Burrito, Werewolven Games, Soulless Rider, Roleplay with Advantage, Stalia, Lost Crusader, Tython, Treb909, Olaf Klepp, Garrett Minnick, JD Green, Famine52, George Fortland, Trevor Hess, Sovereign Mine, Larian's Folly, Draglogia5, Hustor, Zeron King, and The Living Guild Pack for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. Alright guys, peace out. Have a great new year.